So I think we read till thirty uh, fourth verse. We have to read the thirty fifth verse. Just a second. So this is the bird's eye view of chapter two. Basically, in the first ten verses, Arjuna is continuing his arguments of not fighting, and in the next twenty verses, basically Krishna is instructing Arjuna in terms of Sankhya Yoga. Telling about the characteristics of the soul, and this knowledge Krishna gave to Arjuna only after uh, Arjuna surrendered to Krishna. So before the surrender, uh, there was a friendly relationship between Krishna and Arjuna, but after the relationship transformed into a guru shishya relationship, then only like Krishna deemed it appropriate to give knowledge of of soul to Arjuna. And then we saw in the last session that from thirty first to thirty eighth words, it is. Krishna is telling about like what is the importance of um, doing our prescribed duties like sakama karma with material desires. So in this section uh, from thirty first verse, Krishna is again and again telling Arjuna that it is very important for you to fight. So we saw that reasoning, right? Like initially Arjuna was saying that even if I win, then also there is no advantage because the relatives which I want to enjoy with. The, they will not be there, and even if I lose, then I will become a beggar. So there is no advantage. But Krishna changed the equation. Uh, just a second. Okay. So Krishna changed this equation by bringing uh, real scriptures into life. That uh, basically, even so, Arjuna should fight even if he loses. Then also he will go to heavenly planets because he will be killed on the battlefield. And any Kshatriya who gets killed on the battlefield, he he goes to higher planets because he is following his dharma, and dharma rakshati rakshata. So who follows dharma, uh, dharma protects him. So if Arjuna stays uh, strong on his dharma, then he will be taken to the heavenly planets if he if he is killed, and if he wins, then he can uh, basically enjoy his kingdom. Although his relatives might not be there, but but he can give a uh, give the Krishna consciousness to the. To the uh, other praja of the king, so that is the main reason why Krishna wants this battle to happen, because uh, the demoniac kings have in, had increased, and uh, as Krishna says in the fourth chapter, yada yada hi dharmasya glane bhavati bharata abhuta nama dharmasya tadatmanam srijamiyam. So whenever there is a decline of religion, or whenever like the demoniac propensities increase beyond the divine, then Krishna comes to protect. To reinstate the religion by killing the demons and by protecting his devotees. So that's why that is the primary reason why Krishna wants this battle to happen. So if Arjuna wins, then it will be a spiritual welfare of the entire kingdom. And if the uh, Arjuna loses, although there will be a like loss on the part of kingdom, but uh, Arjuna himself will go to go to higher planets. So from Arjuna's spiritual uh, destiny, there is no loss. In in fighting, and that's what uh, Krishna is telling so, uh, Arjuna. So in our daily duties, also like we should understand this that we we should do our duty uh, very religiously, and uh, with uh, like consciousness behind doing the duty is also very important. That how we can remain in mode of goodness and do the do the duty according to our capacity and according to our speed. So that is important. And the next section, actually, like today, we will start most probably the next section from 39th verse to 53rd verse that talks about buddhi yoga. So buddhi yoga means uh, like doing our duties without being attached to fruits. So how we can fix our intelligence on Krishna? How we can fix our in, like take out our intelligence from the fruits and rather like have a higher taste for that intelligence? Because generally, like right now, whatever reason Sarjana is giving, he is. He is thinking about the consequences. That is also a good, uh, like, quality of a leader that he should envision what are the positives and negatives of of a particular action which he is going to take. But generally, all the uh, like reasoning which he is giving, that is on the platform of uh, on, on the bodily platform, and he he has some material attachments with his relatives because of which he is uh, finding himself paralyzed on the battlefield, and it is only by the uh basically instructions of krishna that arjuna finds some inspiration so generally we uh, this is also like very important that many many times like we don't uh, 
like we don't feel inspired or we don't feel enthusiastic to do a particular duty but when we start practicing krishna consciousness and we take association of devotees or read bhagavad gita then actually something some empowerment comes so that that is krishna actually so krishna acts through that devotee and that uh, and he basically uh, gives that strength that spiritual strength to us when we take association of that devotee so yeah so i will tell you a story basically uh, there is a story of arjuna so arjuna basically in the Mah- mahabharat battle he killed so many warriors like left right and center he could kill karna he could kill duryodhan and like even the kauravas army was like uh, more in strength rather than the pandavas then also basically arjuna was able to kill all of them because krishna was by his side and he with his gandiva which was gifted by indra he could kill everybody but but basically the same arjuna after uh, like uh, maybe 50 100 years uh, krishna left this uh, earth and he he disappeared actually so the, it was a scheduled thing like krishna left this earthly planet and went back to his uh, spiritual planet and after that basically arjuna was uh, just walking through a forest and trying to like protect the queens of krishna and he had that gandiv and he was just going through the forest and there were like 10 to 12 cowherd boys who with whom uh, arjuna was fighting and arjuna was totally like very fiercely and very brutally uh, defeated by these cowherd boys and uh, because of this uh, defeat like arjuna was totally like flabbergasted and totally confused that why is this happening because initially arjuna could uh, like defeat all the all the warriors on the battlefield but now because krishna's empowerment is not there krishna is not there krishna's association is not there for arjuna he could not even navigate those queens through those coward boys so the coward boys could immediately with who were without any weapon they could uh, defeat arjuna just by their hands and legs so that is the like speciality like uh, as is it, as it is said that mare krishna rakhe ke and rakhe krishna mare ke so so when basically one a person who who is protected by krishna nobody can harm him and a person who is deemed to uh, dis- distract or maybe he grew old which affected no actually not that is not the case uh, this is there in the bhagavatam story so so one uh, basically one who is doomed one who is meant to be destroyed like nobody can save him if krishna Uh, wants him to be destroyed for example shishupal kansa all these personalities like they are they were meant to be destroyed and uh, narad muni came to facilitate their uh, their destiny so so the hand of krishna we have to see and we have to take protection of krishna and then only basically that real strength comes so on the battlefield of uh, kurukshetra also like uh, the other uh, basically it is said that krishna took out the enthusiasm of kauravas and there were many other techniques also as all of you might be familiar with uh, that krishna took to to ensure the win of pandavas over over the kauravas so yeah so this krishna factor is difficult to understand but uh, eventually like when we read uh, when we take devotee association when we experience the taste of internal potency then we can uh, understand little bit little bit little bit yeah and go forward <clears throat> so let us continue like uh, from the 35th verse so i'll just project yeah that is there like he krishna is everywhere like krishna is there in the atom also krishna is in all of our hearts but when krishna's empowerment is not there that is upon krishna like whether he want to wants to empower or not so so when krishna's empowerment is not there then then we, can, we will not be able to do anything for example we are like continuing our sessions right for last three and a half months and in spite of so many difficulties in spite of so many losses so krishna's empowerment is there like acharya's empowerment is there that's why we are able to gather together and all of your eagerness is there that's why we are able to discuss something meaningful and take take, uh, take away something uh, positive uh, to our lives so krishna's empowerment acharya's empowerment has to be there in order to do anything uh, 
meaningful in this Kali Yuga. Yeah. So this is the like 35th verse. Bhayadrana duparatam mamsyante tva maharata yesham chatvam bahumato bhutva yasya silagavam the great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear only, and thus they will consider your, you insignificant. Purport. Lord Krishna continued to give his verdict to Arjuna. Do not think that the great generals like Turyodhan, Karna, and other temp contemporaries will think that you have left the battlefield out of compassion for your brothers and grandfathers. They will think that you have left out of fear for your life, and thus their high estimation of your personality will go to hell. Yeah, so Arjuna was giving his own reason that better for me to be to become a beggar rather than uh, like fight this battle. But Krishna is showing him the true picture that if he doesn't fight, then he will be considered a very uh, foolish person, very fearful person who is uh, a coward and who doesn't want to fight. And that will bring bad name to his uh, to his family and to the good legacy which he which Arjuna is carrying, Vrishnis and Pritas. So both the sides. Uh, Arjuna's family was very, very qualified and highly, highly elevated in spiritual matter. Yeah, so Krishna is showing the mirror that actual, actual picture is this rather than what you are telling. So again, like we, like this, uh, basically this, uh, this principle is coming again and again that we might see things in our way, but, but the real picture we can only see when we, uh, basically when we interact with devotees who have higher vision, who have spiritual vision. Yeah. So, for example, uh, like these days we are uh, going through Ramayana, right? So, when uh, Lord Ram goes to exile, then uh, there is a dialogue between uh, Sumitra and Kaushalya. So, Sumitra is the mother of uh, Lakshman, and Kaushalya is the mother of Lord Ram. So, they both were uh, very, very sad because Lord Ram uh, basically was fixed upon uh, following the instruction of his father. But so, but Sumitra was very, very like uh, courageous, and he had he was a very great devotee. So he was consoling Kaushalya that although your son is going to forest, but uh, it is all good because wherever Krishna is, wherever Lord Ram is, like trans, like everything he he converts into spiritual. He everything becomes transcendental because rishis are waiting in the forest, insects are waiting, moon is waiting, sun is waiting for Lord Ram's association. So like that, basically, Sumitra is uh, giving uh, consolations and basically Ashwasan in Hindi. So Ashwasan is giving three, four, three, four, three, four, three, So basically, this is the art of a devotee. Uh, just a second. Yeah, so so there might be like, Kaushalya is very, very sad. Okay, Lord Ram, my son is going to forest. A person who has lived in the kingdom for last 20 years and he had so many luxuries, so many family members. Now he will not be having any luxury. He will have to sleep on the ground. He will have to bear the insects, bear the all the animals, bear the demons, especially in the forest. So what will happen to my to my son? So so, so his mother, Lord Ram's mother, is totally like a grip of negative emotions. And Sumitra is actually giving him the real picture that uh, Lord Rama is uh, Purush, Purushottama and dharma, dharma stapna so basically different words uh, uh, different words uh, sumitra is using for glorifying lord ram and he is uh, like consoling kaushalya that whatever is happening is happening for good and for the spiritual welfare for everybody so that that's what uh, basically so this counsel has to happen like whenever uh, we experience uh, something which is out of the blue then we have to like uh, take association of devotees and discuss with them uh, that what is the actual picture and then we we can have some support and uh, whatever because we we face we face negative emotion like it is very uh, natural that whenever something uh, something happens it triggers some belief in our mind that we that it is very hard to accept so it takes some time it takes some spiritual energy to come to the point of acceptance and it takes some uh, like discussion on a, on a broader level, understanding the higher picture, uh, that, those things, and more positive energy and more uh, connectivity, which uh, which bring, brings us into acceptance. And basically, the acceptance and the connectivity comes comes through the uh, through these uh, taking of devotee association and 
uh, chanting the holy name and reading scriptures in the association of devotees so like this uh, like in scriptures we will find uh, like there are various stories where these things keep on happening and then uh, munis and rishis come to to transform the trauma into transcendence by instructing them in the spiritual matter so similar thing happened with chitraketu also like he had a son known as harsha shoka basically initially he was not ready for, to receive the spiritual instructions of narad muni uh, and angira rishi but uh, once his son was born uh, harsha shoka then he got killed also because uh, the rest of the ranis were very envious of the rani from whom uh, the son was born then they poisoned harsha shoka the rest of the ranis who were envious so so at that point when when his son when his only son died he was totally in uh, like negative emotions and all the distress condition so at that time narad muni and angira rishi came again and instructed him and narad muni actually brought his son to life and then his son instructed him about the uh, like uh, about the knowledge of soul that actually i have like who are you uh, like i have so many parents i am not able to recognize which set of parents you are so basically that instruction narad muni gives through through that uh, like enlivened son so that's why basically uh, like some some touch some connectivity with scriptures is required to deal with the with the situations which are happening around all of us yeah. <clears throat> okay let's go to the next verse avachya vadam sa bahun vidasyanti tava hita nindantastava samarthyam tato dukha taram nukim your enemies will describe you in many unkind words and scorn your ability what could be more painful for you yeah lord krishna was astonished in the beginning at arjuna's uncalled for plea for compassion and he described his compassion as befitting the non aryans now so many words he has proved his statements against arjuna's so called compassion so these aryans basically aryans are those section of society who are concerned about their uh, spiritual welfare who who know that how to make progress towards krishna so so these days like there is a arya samaj which which doesn't really teach about the vedic principles but they have a proper like rules and regulation they might be good at some things like discipline but they are not really teaching uh, how to go forward how to connect on a spiritual platform with krishna so this that is the difference between aryans and non aryans like arjuna belonged to that dynasty which was entirely aryans and that's what krishna is telling again and again arjuna that you should see things on a spiritual platform rather than calculating making your own calculation on the material platform yeah so every reason every reason which arjuna was giving like krishna very systematically is defeating all those reasons अतो वाप्सी स्वर्ग जिवा मोक्षसे महीम तस्मादुत्तिष्टकुंतेयुद्धा कृत निश्चय ओ सन ऑफ कुंती आइदर यू विल बी किल्ड ऑन द बैटल फील्ड एंड अटेन दी प्लैनेट्स और यू विल कॉन्क्यूअर एंड एंजॉय द अर्थली किंगडम देर फोर गेट अप विथ डिटर्मिनेशन एंड फाइंड सो दिस इज दी लाइक कंक्लूडिंग क्रैक स्टेटमेंट ऑफ दिस सेक्शन दैट इफ यू आर किल्ड देन यू विल गो टू हेवनली प्लैनेट्स एंड and if you are able to conquer then you will enjoy the earthly kingdom yeah even though there was no certainty of victory for arjuna's side he still had to fight for even being killed there he could be elevated into the heavenly planets yeah so for, for all of us like uh, right like when we were when we go to work and we have to work right but there is no certainty that our manager will be satisfied or will get any promotion or will get an increment but but since we have assigned to that service we should do that service like with gaining spiritual strength not uh, not really um, expecting too much from our manager or the company but we should help the company because the company is maintaining us yeah yani do you want to ask something uh, no no by mistake it no. okay yeah so generally like uh, this section is also like uh, krishna again and again telling arjuna that you should fight without attachment and you should fight because i am ordering you to fight so actually there are four levels of surrender 
basically when so there are four types of people also who come to krishna and that we will learn in the seventh chapter but there are four levels of surrender today we were discussing that that the lowest level is basically we surrender out of fear that okay like if i don't surrender to krishna if i if i don't offer uh, bhava to krishna then i will incur sinful reaction if i don't read bhagavad gita i will i will be like uh, i will be entangling more and more into this uh, material nature so that is uh, basically following krishna consciousness out of fear and then the second level is uh, surrender out of uh, because of gaining fruits so we want something from krishna and that's why we surrender like we want uh, maybe a good job or maybe a good wife or maybe good children or maybe good salary good car good good house so these things if we want some material things then we worship krishna we think that okay all the people who are in his con like they are very cultured and they are very rich so if we go to his con then we also might become rich so that is the second level like uh, the second last level of surrender that we are surrendering because we want something from krishna and then there is that uh, like third last level which is the second level that surrendering out of duty that it is my duty to surrender krishna because as a human being it is our duty to worship krishna because eating sleeping mating defending these four things like uh, animals are also doing ahar nidra bhayamat naam cha samanya etat pashubir narana dharmo hi eko vishesho dharme na hi na pashubir samana so basically this verse is there in bhagavatam that this eating sleeping mating mating and defending ahar nidra bhayamat these things these four things animals are also doing then if if as human beings also we we do only these four things then what is the difference between us and animals so that that's where the basically dharma kings kicks in that we understand that what is the purpose of this human life and then take incremental steps uh, in that direction so yeah so that is the like second level that as a duty as a duty we we do krishna consciousness we we chant uh, maybe one round two rounds and we do our occupational duty sincerely in mode of goodness and we uh, basically cater to the needs of our family members so this is basically and and then connecting everything to krishna so this is basically uh, doing krishna consciousness out of duty and then the first level of surrender which is the best is surrendering out of love so when there is devotion when there is connectivity with krishna then krishna will reciprocate and that loving relationship will grow you will have full love and trust in uh, krishna and then basically you will be doing your duties you will be do- dealing with your family members out of love that affection that shuddha shuddha sattva you will come over the mode of goodness and you will reach the unalloyed goodness where you will your exchanges will be very very full of affection and spiritual love so that is the first uh, level of surrender that basically you you are doing your duties out of love you are feeling so much uh, spiritual protection and spiritual bliss that you know that uh, I, you are always with krishna you are experiencing that, that bliss and that bliss you are transmitting uh, in all your activities starting from your chanting and then basically in your occupational duty and then dealing with your family members so that is the highest level of surrender that we surrender out of love yeah so let's read the next words sukha dukhe same kritva labha labho jaya jayo tato yuddhaye jivasva nevam papam avapsasi do your fight for the sake of fighting without considering happiness or distress loss or gain victory or defeat and by so by so doing you shall never incur sin yeah so this labha labha jaya jayo this these words will continue in bhagavad gita matra sparshas tu kon teya shitoshna sukha dukha so these are all dualities of this material world which we have to tolerate and if we are not getting the strength to tolerate then we we should take association of those who have the strength to tolerate who can show you the bigger picture yes yeah nidhi you want to read or oh, nidhi has left okay who wants anybody wants to read the purport yeah rashali you want yeah sure i can uh, please bear with me one second yeah 
okay but okay fine <clears throat> Lord Krishna now directly says that Arjuna should fight for the sake of fighting because he desires the battle. There is no consideration of happiness or distress, profit or loss, victory or defeat in the activities of Krishna consciousness. That everything should be performed for the sake of Krishna is transcendental consciousness. So there is no reaction to material activities. He who acts for his own sense gratification, either in goodness or in passion, is subjected to reaction, good or bad. But he who has completely surrendered himself in the activities of Krishna consciousness is no longer obliged to anyone, nor is he a debtor to anyone, as one is in the ordinary course of activities. It is said anyone who has completely surrendered unto Krishna consciousness, giving up all other duties, is no longer a debtor, nor is he obliged to anyone, not the demigods, not the sages, not the people in general, nor kinsmen, nor humanity, nor forefathers. That is the indirect hint given by Krishna to Arjuna in this verse. And the matter will be more clearly explained in the following verse. Yeah, thank you. Very nice. Yeah, so as I was describing the four levels of surrender now here, actually Prabhupada is talking about uh, surrender only, right? Oh, surrender mentioned? Yeah, completely surrendered himself in the activities of okay, the activities of Krishna consciousness is no longer obliged. Yeah, so as soon as we like enter this material world, we, we are given a set of parents and we enter uh, womb of a mother. So actually, we become indebted uh, to the. So we had, we have debt. We have debt to our forefathers, because uh, in the lineage of our forefathers, we are taking shelter of a body, and of a of a set of parents, and then we are debt. Uh, we are indebted to demigods because demigods are arranging all the uh, proper weather and uh, the grains, milk, everything. And then we are indebted to our sages also, like because sages, because of their austerities and tapasya, they have given us uh, this shastra, these Vedas, Bhagavad Gita. So all these three debts had to be had, have to be paid in order to like live a peaceful and liberated life in this material body. So you can pay the debt to the forefathers by begetting children, and you can pay the uh, pay the debt to the demigods by like doing suitable sacrifices. And you can pay the debt to the sages by reading scriptures, by practicing uh, Krishna consciousness and understanding basically scriptures, having a holistic, comprehensive understanding of scriptures. But but the good thing is like you don't need to do all these three things if you follow Krishna consciousness. Like if you su surrender totally unto Krishna Mukunda, and uh, then you don't your uh, debts will automatically be. Uh, like resolved by by the following of uh, Krishna consciousness and the process of pure devotional service, but like all of us are not at that level right now. So like we have to like maybe do some incremental steps in the right direction, and that is that is the starting point. But gradually, gradually we, we have to come to the level of pure uh, pure devotion where, and that happens by the by the guidance of a bona fide uh, spiritual master. And yeah, so I was I was planning to have some sessions from some more senior devotees also. So I will keep you posted. And as soon as we finish this second chapter, then we'll invite somebody who can give us a more deeper insight into like where we are and where we want to go and how to like traverse this path and go forward. Yeah. So this is the highest principle that if you like if you reach the highest platform of Krishna consciousness, uh, you you are no more indebted to to either the demigods or sages or your family members. That's what uh, Krishna is telling us, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, let's read this. Eshate vihita sankhe buddhir yoge tva imam shridu buddhya yukto yaya partha karma bandham prahasasi Thus far, I have described this knowledge to you through analytical study. Now, listen as I explain it in terms of working without fruitive results. O son of Pritha, when you act in such knowledge, you can free yourself from the bondage of works. Yeah, so this is the like transitional words between the two sections. So till now, uh, Krishna was explaining uh, 
uh, to Arjuna the Sankhya Yoga, where he was distinguished in, uh, distinguishing between the properties of matter and properties of spirit. But now he will explain about Buddhi Yoga, that how we can work without uh, like having fruitive, fruitive desires, without getting attached to the results. Because our department is service department, and results department is Krishna's department. And then when we work like that in that way, then we can work uh, continuously without accruing any any negative uh, reaction, any simple reaction. <clears throat> so that's what Krishna is saying, that the result of acting in such a consciousness is that you can free yourself, totally get liberated from on the Karma Yoga platform. Yeah. I think we can read this uh, purport. And uh, then maybe this can be the last words to talk today. Yeah, Naveen, you want to read one paragraph maybe from this? Uh, yeah, Rajata, I, I can do that. Should I start? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead According to the Nirupi or the Vedic dictionary, Sankhya means that which describes things in detail, and Sankhya refers to that philosophy which describes the real nature of the soul. And yoga involves controlling the senses. Arjuna's proposal not to fight was based on sense gratification. Forgetting his prime duty, he wanted to cease fighting because he thought that by not killing his relatives and kinsmen, he would be happier than by enjoying the kingdom after conquering his cousins and brothers, the sons of Dhritarashtra. In both ways, the basic principles were for sense gratification. Happiness derived from conquering them and happiness derived by seeing kinsmen alive are both on the basis of personal sense gratification, even at a sacrifice of wisdom and duty. Krishna therefore wanted to explain to Arjuna that by killing the body of his grandfather, he would not be killing the soul proper. And he explained that all individuals, individual persons, including the Lord himself, are eternal individuals. They were individuals in the past, they are individuals in the present, and they will continue to remain individuals in the future because all of us are individual souls eternally. We simply change our bodily dress in different manners. Actually, we keep our individuality even after liberation from the bondage of material dress. An analytical study of the soul and the body has been very graphically explained by Lord Krishna. And this descriptive knowledge of the soul and the body from different angles of vision has been described here as Sankhya in terms of the Niruti dictionary. This Sankhya has nothing to do with the Sankhya philosophy of the atheist Kapila. Long before the imposter Kapila's Sankhya, Sankhya philosophy was expounded in Srimad Bhagavatam by the true Lord Kapila, the incarnation of Lord Krishna, who explained it to his mother, Devahuti. It is clearly explained by him that the Purusha or the Supreme Lord is active and that he creates by looking over the Prakriti. This is accepted in the Vedas and in the Gita. The description in the Vedas indicates that the Lord glanced over the Prakriti or nature and impregnated it with atomic individual souls. All these individuals are working in the material world for sense gratification and under the spell of material energy, they are thinking of being enjoyers. This mentality is dragged to the last point of liberation when the living entity wants to become one with the Lord. This is the last snare of Maya or sense gratificatory illusion. And it is only after many, many births of such sense gratificatory activities that a great soul surrenders unto Vasudeva, Lord Krishna, thereby fulfilling the search after the ultimate truth. Hmm. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Narayan. Thank you. Yeah, I think there are a lot of very deep points here in this paragraph. So actually, this uh, creation and uh, annihilation of this material world, this happens after every, every Chatur Yoga. So as I told, like as we have discussed this in, in previous sessions also, that uh, this Sat Yoga, Treta Yoga, Dwapar Yoga, Kali Yoga, that is, a, that is known as one Chatur Yoga. And thousand such Chatur Yoga forms one Kalpa, which is one, one day of Brahma. So, so after every Chatur Yuga, actually, uh, like the Kali Yuga is reinstated into Satyuga. 
but at the end of the thousand cycles the entire material world is annihilated by by lord shiva and then uh, basically the, at uh, that is the night of brahma so the brahma goes to sleep and the entire cosmic manifestation in that universe gets annihilated and then all the living entities they get stuck onto the body of mahavishnu and when again brahma wakes up uh, the night gets finished then again uh, basically brahma creates the entire universe and all those uh, living entities which were stuck to the body of mahavishnu they are actually injected into the uh, into the bodies and into the universe created by lord brahma so this is the actual uh, creation and annihilation actual cosmic manifestation creation which is given in our scriptures and uh, not the big bang theory so that's what uh, basically uh, prabhupad is telling here that ultimately we are like eternal spirit souls even even though we die but there is a destiny which uh, krishna has for us in, in the next life and that is what uh, basically that is what scriptures are emphasizing on again and again <coughs> yeah so ravi uh, ravi prabhu you would like to read the next paragraph sure prabhu sure just just a second huh? yeah yeah uh, is it starting from uh, yeah arjuna yeah from here yeah hmm. hari krishna yes bro yes from here yeah arjuna has already accepted krishna as his spiritual master by surrendering himself onto him shishyas te ham siddhi mai mam twam pra prapanam prapanam consequently krishna will now tell him about the working process in buddhi yoga or karma yoga or in um, other words the practice practice of devotional service only for the sense gratification of the lord buddhi yoga is the clearly uh, explained in chapter 10 verse 10 as being as being direct uh, com- communion with the lord who is sitting as parmatma in the devotional or transcendental loving service to the god Uh, in everyone's heart by by but such communion does not take place without devotional service one who is therefore situated in the devotional or transcendental transcendental loving service to the lord or in other words in krishna consciousness attains to this stage uh, of buddhi yoga by the special grace of the lord the lord says there are therefore that only to those who are always engaged Uh, in devotional service out of transcendental love does he award the pure knowledge of devotion in love in that way he uh, in that way the devotees can reach him easily in ever blissful yeah this has this has been my favorite thing i mean it's in chapter 10 but this is where i found that krishna has finally disclosed how he serves a devotee in devotional service hare krishna yes sir thank you तेषा सतत युक्ता भजता प्रीतिपूर्वक ददा बुद्धि कृष्ण विद लव एंड डिवोशन देन कृष्ण गिव्स हिम इंटेलिजेंस थ्रू इन दि हार्ट सो या सो बेसिकली दिस इज दि गोल ऑफ लाइफ लाइक सम हाउ इफ यू कैन सर्च आउट सुपर सोल विद इन अवर हार्ट सो डैट इज सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल लाइक यू वॉन्ट टू फाइंड गोल्ड राइट सो यू विल यू विल कीप डिगिंग इन दि इन दि अर्थ एंड यू विल फाइंड लॉट्स ऑफ other other contaminations there will be very very big uh, amount of lands which which might not be gold but you will get it and you will clear it you will take it out because you are you are in the search of gold so so you have to be st- uh, strong in your determination to find the gold and similarly like you have to be very uh, very diligent and very determined in the practice of your krishna consciousness to find lord within your heart to find the super soul within your heart and when once you find find him then he will give you instructions he will give you intelligence he will give you indications he will give you intuition that that what to do in what situation 
So th that's what is actually Krishna consciousness is. And all the activities uh, are basically meant for this uh, realization, are meant. So, Jitatmana Prashantasya Paramatma Samayita. So, as soon as our, we can conquer our mind, the super soul is already reached. So, it is only the layer of the mind which is stopping us to reach the super soul. And that's what Lekupad is telling in this uh, paragraph that as soon as we reach the super soul, that then we become to in, in, commun in communion with the Supreme Lord. And then uh, Krishna gives us intelligence. And that is Buddhi Yoga, actually, when we can fix our intelligence on Krishna. And it requires basically, so this is the like purification of mind and artha That is That is to be practiced in the association of devotees. And uh, that's what is our process. So as I told that, Adho Shraddha Tathak Sadhu Sangha Tato Bhajana Kriya Tato Anartha Nivriti Syat. So all of you have faith in Krishna and, and people who are giving Krishna. That's why you are, all of you are here. And now you are all of you are here. That's why we are doing. Uh, basically, all of us, like you are doing, you, are, you want to associate with sadhus. And in the association of sadhus, you are doing Bhajan Kriya. And when you do Bhajan Kriya, then basically Anartha Nivriti happens. And when Anartha Nivriti is completed, then you reach Nishta. So in Nishta stage, you, you have spontaneous devotion and you have spontaneous uh, transcendental touch of Krishna within your heart. So like this, basically, we have to uh, keep making, keep taking steps towards Krishna and always have faith, faith in Krishna that whatever is happening around us, that is actually a plan of Krishna only. Like uh, the Krishna is the controller. We are not the controller. If Krishna wants something to be taken away, then he will take away. Like there is no, there is no other, uh, like we have to accept that. We have to take association of uh, saintly persons and bring positive energy to accept that situation. Yeah. So next paragraph, uh, Hinamata, do you want to read? Yeah. Thus the Buddhi Yoga mentioned in this verse is the devotional service of the Lord and the word Sankhya mentioned herein has nothing to do with the atheistic Sankhya Yoga enunciated by the imposter Kapila. One should not therefore misunderstood, misunderstand that the Sankhya Yoga mentioned herein has any connection with the with the atheistic Sankhya, nor did that philosophy have an influence during that time, nor would Lord Krishna care to mention such godless philosophical speculations. Real Sankhya philosophy is described by Lord Kapila in the Srimad Bhagavatam. But even that Sankhya has nothing to do with the current topics. Here, Sankhya means analytical descriptions of the body and the soul. Lord Krishna made an analytical description of the soul just to bring Arjuna to the point of Buddhi Yoga or Bhakti Yoga. Therefore, Lord Krishna's Sankhya and Lord Kapila's Sankhya, as described in the Bhagavatam, are one and the same. They are all Bhakti Yoga. Lord Krishna said, therefore, that only the less intelligent class of men make a distinction between Sankhya Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. Sankhya Yoga Prathag Bala Pravadanti Na Pandita. Hmm. Of course, aesthetic san Sankhya Yoga has nothing to do with Bhakti Yoga. Yet, the unintelligent claim that the atheistic Sankhya Yoga is referred to the Bhagavad Gita. Hare Krishna. Yeah, thank you. One should therefore understand that Buddha Yoga means to work in Krishna consciousness in the full bliss and knowledge of devotional service. One who works for the satisfaction of the Lord only, however difficult such work may be, is working under the principles of Buddha Yoga and finds himself always in transcendental bliss. By such transcendental engagement, one achieves or transcendental understanding automatically by the grace of the Lord and thus his liberation is complete in itself without his making extraneous endeavors to acquire knowledge. There is much difference between working Krishna consciousness and work for fruit of results, especially in the matter of sense gratification for achieving the results in terms of 
family or material happiness. With the yoga is therefore the transcendental quality of the work that we perform. Yeah, so basically in this purport, Prabhupada is giving some introduction to Buddhi Yoga, like what is Buddhi Yoga? So when we, uh, basically when we are totally connected to Krishna and we perform our work for the pleasure of Krishna, because actually we are meant for the pleasure of Krishna. We are meant for the sense gratification of Krishna. All our senses belong to Krishna. So Rishi Kena, Rishi Kesha Sevna. So when we serve Krishna, when we satisfy Krishna, our senses also become satisfied in that process. So that is Buddhi Yoga. When you feel connected to Krishna, when you feel connected to the transcendence, then automatically whatever work you are doing, that will be transcendence. That you will not be attached to the results because you know that Lord will take care, Lord Krishna will take care of the results. I just have to stay connected to Krishna and just uh, keep doing all my services and rest uh, rest all, uh, rest assured Krishna will take care of our all, all the other basic necessities and results. Okay, so from next session, we will start the Buddha Yoga session that like Arjuna will ask question that what are the symptoms of a person who is who is in a Buddha Yoga state. So all this, all those things we will cover in this uh, fourth section of this chapter. So any questions? Yeah, Prabhu, I have one or two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, one is that uh, is mind also one of the sense organs? Yes, Prabhu. Like uh, in the 15th chapter, there is one verse: "Mame vancho jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana manasasthani indriyani prakriti stoni karshati." So, in that verse, Krishna is saying manasasthani indriyani. So, mana plus five senses. And he's uh, addressing all these six things as six indriyas. So you can consider mind as the as one of the senses only. But 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 the position of mind is above all the five senses. Right, bro. Yeah, exactly. And uh, somewhere in the same chapter or previous chapter, he says that false ego, intelligence, and the unmanifested are also part of this subtle body. Um, right, he's he's describing some twenty-four elements of the material body, chetra. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm I'm just crossing, uh, I'm jumping across the chapters, but it's just a doubt because I was reading chapter fourteen, fifteen. So, what is unmanifested? Because it's not intelligence. He says intelligence, false ego, and the unmanifested is part of the subtle body, while mind and the other five sense organs are also part of the same thing. So, so somewhere he's describing the twenty-four elements of the chetra. Hmm. Yes, yes. My yes, question is, what is unmanifested? Un yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's discuss this in our uh, other sessions. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Forum is correct sure. for these deep inquiries. Sure, 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 sure. No problems. Thank you. Anyways, thank you for the question. Thank so you. Any... Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, any other questions? Yeah, on a maybe on a broader level, I will just tell that at the end of third chapter, we will study about this hierarchy. That uh, there is a verse in at the end of third chapter, Indriyani Paranyahur, Indriyabhya Paramana, Yo. What is the second line? Manasastu para buddhi, Yo buddhi paratastu sa. So Indriyani Paranyahur, Indriyabhya Paramana. So basically, above the dull matter is the senses, and above the senses is the mind. Indriyabhya paramana. Manasastu para buddhe, yo buddhe paratastu sa. And above the mind, there is spirit soul. Above the mind, there is intelligence, and above the intelligence is the spirit soul. Yeah. So we'll we'll study all these things in the third chapter. No need to. Sure, sure, sure. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for all of you Thank joining. You. Yes, sorry, I joined late. There was some important call, so I couldn't avoid that. Sorry. Send, yeah, thank you. Uh, send the recording. I'll, I'll definitely go through the recording. Yeah. Okay, bro. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.